Welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed installment of our commercial real estate training series. I'm your host, Lauren Keim, with Real Estate's Next Level Education and with Lehigh University's Goodman Center for Real Estate Studies. And this program is titled An Introduction to Commercial Real Estate Leases. It doesn't matter if you're assisting clients with selling, leasing, managing, or investing in real property. You need to understand real estate leases. As I've said in previous sessions of our training system, commercial real estate encompasses all aspects of sales, leasing, management, investment in, improvement of real property, and they are absolutely integral to virtually every aspect of commercial real estate. A commercial agent or broker obviously must understand leases in order to lease and negotiate space for their clients, whether their client is a landlord or a tenant. Additionally, leases and the various methods that building costs are split between landlords and tenants are an integral part of determining a property's value. And the sales price of most income producing properties is directly related to the income the property or building generates after expenses. A full understanding of leases and how they function is necessary to properly advise your commercial investors and your property sellers. One caveat to this program, however, is to remind you, our viewer, that I am neither an accountant nor an attorney. And the clauses contained within this session are not intended to constitute legal advice or opinion. The material is designed to introduce leasing concepts and to guide you in potential strategies to be successful in your career. To outline what we'll be discussing today, we're going to start by discussing what is a lease and understanding that lease from both the tenant and the landlord's positions. Second, we'll discuss the various types of lease payments like gross lease, triple net lease, and percentage lease. We'll also spend a bit of time discussing CAM fees or common area maintenance fees and expense stops or base stops. The third part of today's program will center around subleasing and fourth, we'll start analyzing leases for the best value. The fifth section is on using a letter of intent or an RFP, a request for proposal. The sixth section is on negotiating the lease and many of the common clauses we'll negotiate. Finally, we'll get to trigger event clauses, landlord or tenant improvements, and tenant allowances, and finish up with some unique forms of leasing, such as land leases. So what is a commercial lease? A lease is a legal contract designed to allow a person group or entity to enjoy the use of a property for a period of time in return for some compensation or value to the property owner, which is typically called rent. Generally, a person or business leases an office, a retail space, or even a parcel of land, and in return pays a monthly, quarterly, or yearly rental fee for the use of that property. Lease contracts are negotiated between the property owners, also known as landlords or lessors, and the property's end users, also known as tenants or lessees. Commercial realtors are often called upon to either represent the interest of the owner or landlord in procuring a tenant and negotiating a lease with that tenant or to represent a tenant or end user to locate and acquire the lease of a property. Realtors also manage the properties on behalf of their clients. Lease contracts spell out the landlord and tenant names, the length of the contract, the amount of the lease payments, how the lease payments will be made, and who's responsible for maintenance and operation of the property. Lease contracts can also be negotiated to include almost any contingency that can be conceived. Some common contingency clauses include escalation of lease payments over time, whether or not those lease payments include a percentage of sales of the tenant, the first right to purchase the property, the ability to sublease the property to another entity, and even clauses that examine the tenant and landlord obligations if the building is destroyed in a disaster like a hurricane, nuclear war, or an alien attack. Many end users of commercial real estate prefer to lease space rather than purchasing. An end user may lease because the location they desire is only available for lease, such as in a prominent shopping center or a particular corner location. The user may lease because they don't have the capital to purchase a property. Or they may have a strategy that will require them to move within a few years and they'd rather not be tied to a particular building or a particular location. Other users determine the net present value to their organization in a lease versus buy analysis and figure out which is most beneficial to them. 
We'll examine that later in our video program on working with tenants. Owners or landlords lease properties in order to obtain a cash flow from the property as a return on the investment they have in the property. Because commercial realtors can represent either side of the transaction, it's important to understand the objectives and points of view of both landlords and tenants. In some objectives, landlords and tenants' views are diametrically opposed from one another, and in other objectives, they're in perfect alignment. So let's start with the end user or tenant's objectives in leasing property. Although a tenant is willing to pay a fair market rent for space that properly meets their needs, the user or tenant naturally wants to pay as little as possible to lease a property and have the owner cover as much of the common area expense as possible. Obviously, a lower lease payment means more money in the tenant's pocket. A tenant is also seeking the right location and a space that's suitable for their particular use. Other contingencies that benefit a tenant include that the landlord will maintain the property, the building, the space, and pay for all building costs and repairs. This puts the risk of escalating expenses, such as taxes and insurance, and the expense of unforeseen repairs directly on the landlord. They want the lease payment to be locked in for a particular period of time, for a long period of time if possible. The landlord will maintain the building or space. The landlord will renovate the space to conform to the needs of the tenant or at least finance the renovation. The tenant will have the right to sublet the space should the need arise. The tenant will have the right to purchase the property at some future time or the landlord may not sell the property without giving the tenant that first right of refusal. The tenant will have the right to automatically renew the lease, and the tenant will have the ability to expand their space at some future point as the need arises. Now, these are all areas that benefit the tenant exclusively. On the other hand, the owner or landlord's objectives are similar, but slanted towards the landlord, of course. The owner of the property is generally looking for the highest rent payment in order to maximize their return on their investment in the property. And a tenant who's willing to cover any increases in the cost for that property they occupy, such as taxes, insurance, and utilities, in order to avoid the erosion of the owner's income as the cost of ownership rises. Owners also desire tenants that will be stable, long-term tenants, so that the owner doesn't have to search for a new tenant and re-rent the property. Additionally, owners seek tenants who will maintain the property and hopefully even improve the property over time at their own expense. Other contingencies that benefit the landlord include an escalation of the lease payments over time, that the tenant will maintain the building or the space, that the tenant will make any improvements to the property, and all improvements are required to be approved by the landlord, an agreement that the tenant will pay part or all of the variable cost of owning the building, including utilities and a percentage of maintenance, taxes, and insurance. Now, there are also points at which tenants and landlords agree. Tenants and landlords both desire the financial health of one another. If a tenant is not financially solid, the landlord may lose that tenant and have to re-rent the space, leaving it potentially vacant for a period of time and incurring costs to improve or re-rent that space. Or worse, a landlord may have to evict a tenant, losing time and money in the court system while trying to remove the tenant from the property. Similarly, a tenant desires a financially healthy landlord because they don't want the negative impact of a foreclosure on the building or a lack of maintenance by the landlord. Other areas where landlords and tenants agree include having a clearly written lease that lays out exactly what the terms of the lease are, the amount of rent, and what that rent includes, and the division of responsibilities for maintenance and utilities between the landlord and tenant. Quoting rental rates. Commercial rent is generally based on the size or square footage of the space being leased. The leasable area can vary depending on the type of property or the conventions of a particular area. For example, office leasable area might only be the space enclosed in an office unit and not include hallways or bathrooms that are shared with other tenants. Other office space may have an additional surcharge for the common space on their floor or the common space in the building based on a percentage of space that the tenant occupies. You can obtain a complete set of standard rules for office space measurement from the Building Owners and Managers Association at www.boma.org. In warehouse or industrial space, leasable area may include covered loading docks or the area and pole buildings on the property. Rental rates are typically quoted as an annual figure. 
For example, a lease rate of $16 per square foot for office space usually means $16 per square foot per year or $1.25 per square foot per month. In order to compute the tenant's monthly rent, the rate must be multiplied by the square footage of the leasable area and then divided by 12. For example, if the rent per year is $16 per square foot and the tenant is leasing 2,625 square feet, then $16 times 2,625 square feet equals $42,000 per year. So the rent per month equals rent per year of $42,000 divided by 12 months equals 3500 bucks. For tenants leasing a multiple use property, such as a property that's partially office space and partially warehouse space, the rate is generally blended between the two uses. Rather than quoting a rate of $16 per square foot for the office and $8 per square foot for the warehouse, the rental is quoted at a blended rate between the two uses. Types of lease payments. Leases are often defined by the type of payment negotiated between the landlord and tenant. If the tenant pays a flat rate in a lease where the landlord pays for all utilities and all maintenance, the lease is called a gross lease or a full service lease. If the tenant pays some of the utilities, maintenance, taxes, insurance, or operating expenses of the building or of the property, the lease is a net or a net net or a triple net lease depending on what expenses the tenant pays. If the tenant pays a portion of their income on top of the rent, it's also known as a percentage lease. Lease types. Although there are variations in the terms and all portions of a lease are negotiable, the most commonly used terms for various lease payments include gross lease, also known as a full service lease. Once again, a gross lease is a lease in which the tenant pays an all-inclusive rental rate, meaning that the landlord pays for all expenses to occupy, maintain, and operate the building. These expenses paid by the landlord include utilities such as water, sewer, and electric, property taxes, insurance, property maintenance, including snow removal and lawn care, repairs, and any common area expenses or security costs. Net lease. This is perhaps the most confused leasing term because some use the term to indicate a lease where the tenant pays their rent plus their utilities and the landlord pays all building expenses, including taxes and insurance. Others use the term to identify a lease where the tenant pays the rent plus a portion of the taxes and the landlord covers the cost of utilities, repairs, and maintenance. And still others use the term interchangeably with triple net, which means the tenant pays all expenses and repairs. So, if you're in an urban area leasing an office or retail property and the utilities cannot be split easily between units, the definition of net lease is likely to mean the tenant is paying one item above the lease which is often a percentage of taxes. If you're in a suburban location where utilities might be split between units, the definition of net lease is a lease where the tenant pays the utilities, such as water, sewer, electric, and heat, and the landlord pays all building expenses, including taxes and insurance, and the tenant and landlord separate the cost of maintenance of the property based on what is in the interior of the space occupied by the tenant and the exterior or common space which is provided by the landlord. Net net lease. Again, this depends on the market in which the property lies, but typically under a net net lease, the tenant pays for utilities and a percentage of the property taxes and insurance in addition to rent. Their obligation for taxes and insurance are generally based on their percentage occupancy of the building or property. Generally, the tenant also pays for any repairs and maintenance inside their unit, and the landlord covers property maintenance on the exterior. Under a triple net lease, net 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 lease, a tenant pays all expenses for the property with exception to capital improvements. Under a triple net or net 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 lease, the tenant pays all utilities like electric, water, sewer, and heat, property maintenance, and the property taxes and insurance. If the tenant is only leasing a portion of the property, the landlord may prorate the cost of maintenance, taxes, and insurance by the percentage leased by the tenant. This is often done through the use of a CAM or Common Area Maintenance Fee. Under a triple net lease, the landlord is still typically responsible for structural repairs. Under an absolute triple net lease, the tenant is responsible for all property costs, including any structural repairs. This is most often associated with a very long-term lease. A percentage lease is a common type of lease found in malls and high-end retail leases. 
A percentage lease requires the tenant to pay a negotiated percentage of the tenant's gross monthly or yearly sales made at the location in addition to a fixed minimum monthly rental payment. Under a percentage lease, the tenant pays a base rent on the space that they occupy and an additional percentage of revenue earned from their business. The underlying concept behind this rental formula is that the landlord's ability to attract strong tenants and provide a successful environment for the center increases the financial success of the individual tenants. And the landlord shares in that success. Except in rare cases, the landlord does not begin collecting additional revenue until the tenant exceeds sales over a break point or a natural break point. An example of a break point is a lease that charges a tenant a rental rate of $24,000 per year plus 3% of sales over $800,000. Or if we divide by 12, a rent of $2,000 per month plus 3% of sales over $66,667 per month. Shopping center leases will also typically pass through the cost for building and property maintenance, taxes, insurance, and management fees in the form of CAM fees or common area maintenance fees. Finally, a modified net lease or hybrid net lease is any negotiated lease under which the landlord and tenant agree to share expenses of utilities, building maintenance or taxes, and insurance between them. Other important terms you'll encounter with commercial leases are common area maintenance fees, base stops, expense stops, and effective rent. Common area maintenance fees, also known as CAM fees or common area maintenance assessments, are a tenant's prorated portion of all maintenance expenses of a property. In a triple net lease, part or all of the cost of maintaining the building may be negotiated to the tenant. This direct pass-through of expenses from landlord to tenant allows the landlord to receive a steady return on the property without concern about rising costs of maintaining the building. CAM fees are often used to cover parking lot maintenance, snow removal, landscape, building security, uh, exterior lighting, shared bathrooms, and even structural maintenance and repairs. In some cases, landlords estimate the CAM charges and build the estimated charges into a lease as a fixed amount, such as $8 per square foot in CAM charges. Alternately, the actual expenses are calculated and the tenant then pays on a per square foot basis based on the percentage of rentable space a tenant occupies. Under the second method, for example, if a tenant occupies 5,000 square feet in a building that contains 100,000 square feet of rentable space, the tenant is responsible for 5% of the total common area maintenance charges. Expense stop or base stop. An expense stop is designed to create a limit or a cap on the expenses paid by one party or another. If an expense stop is utilized to benefit a landlord, the lease includes a clause that the landlord will cover building operating expenses up to a specified amount called an expense stop. The tenant then becomes responsible for the operating expenses above that expense stop. The specified amount is generally stated on a per square foot basis. As an illustration, a lease might specify that a tenant shall pay a rental rate of $24 per square foot per year as long as expenses do not exceed $8 per square foot of rentable area. The tenant shall pay their proportional share of the expenses above this level. If the building contains 100,000 square feet of rentable area, the landlord is responsible for $8 per square foot or the first $800,000 in annual operating expenses. If the actual annual operating expenses are $1 million, since the landlord's portion of the expenses are capped or limited to $800,000, then $200,000 of the expense shall be shared by the tenants by their proportionate use of the building. If the tenant occupies 20,000 square feet of 100,000 square feet of rentable space, the tenant is responsible for 20% of the expense coverage or $40,000. Let's run through that as an example again. A landlord expense stop is $8 per square foot on a 100,000 square foot building. $8 times 100,000 square feet equals 800,000. The overage is the actual expense minus the landlord expense stop. So the actual expense is $1 million and $1 million minus the $800,000 landlord expense stop leaves an overage of $200,000. If the tenant's portion of that overage is 20%, then 20% times $200,000 leaves the tenant paying $40,000 of that overage. Another method is to cap the landlord contribution to the actual expenses from a base year, which is the year the tenant takes possession of the space. 
The tenant is then responsible for the increase over the expenses of the first year. So if the expenses in the first year are $100,000 for their portion of the space and those expenses rise to $105,000 in the second year, the tenant is responsible for the $5,000 overage. Alternately, a reverse expense stop requires the tenant to pay the operating expenses up to a certain level or expense stop level and the landlord becomes responsible for expenses above that level. Most often, an expense stop or base stop is used to protect the landlord from escalating expenses of a building. Keep in mind that the most likely sales price of a building to an investor is based on the net operating income of that building. An expense stop helps to curb or stop the erosion of the net operating income and shift the risk of rising costs to the tenant. The effective rent is another term you'll need to be familiar with. With so many variations of how rent is paid, clients will want to know what they're really paying once all the different fees and cost of occupancy are added together. One method of determining the occupancy cost for a tenant is to compute the effective rent. Effective rent is most often described in a price per square foot. The calculation is to add the entire base rent, the CAM fees, and other tenant paid expenses for the period of the lease, including escalations, and subtract any cash allowances and free rent, and then divide by the term of the lease and then by the square footage. For example, a tenant is negotiating for a 3,000 square foot space for three years with a base rent of $12 per square foot for the first year with an escalation of 50 cents per square foot per year. The CAM charges paid by the tenant are $4.25 per square foot with an escalation of $0.25 cents per square foot per year. The landlord is offering three months free rent plus a $3,000 cash contribution for a moving expense. Sounds pretty complicated, doesn't it? And we need to understand the cost of this lease versus the cost of other leases the tenant may be considering. To calculate the effective rent, we must first compute the gross occupancy cost for each year. The gross occupancy cost equals the base rent plus tenant paid expenses minus contributions or free rent from the landlord. So in year one, for example, the base rent is $12 per square foot times 3,000 square feet. That equals $36,000. But the landlord's giving three months free, so we back off $9,000 from that rent, and in the first year, we're left with a cost of $27,000. We then have to add the tenant paid expenses back into that cost to determine what the tenant is actually paying. The expected tenant paid expenses are $12,750, but the landlord is giving a $3,000 moving expense. So the gross cost of year one equals $27,000 in rent plus $12,750 in tenant expenses less a $3,000 moving allowance. The gross cost is $36,750. In years two and three, as you can see on the chart, both base rent and tenant paid expenses or CAM fees increase. The total cost in year two is expected to be $51,000 and that goes up to $53,250 in year three. The total cost of the tenant over the three year period is $141,000. In order to determine the effective cost per square foot of the space, we divide that $141,000 by the period of three years and then by 3,000 square feet to determine the effective rent is $15.67 per square foot. In some markets, an alternate definition for effective rent is the rent actually received by the landlord after all concessions are considered. Subleasing. When a tenant has a space contracted under a lease but is not using the space or not using all the space, they will often attempt to locate another business and sublet that space to that new tenant. Under a sublease, the subleasee or subtenant pays rent to a sublessor who pays the landlord. The original tenant remains responsible for the original terms of the lease to the landlord of the property. The landlord in this situation is also known as the master lessor. From the tenant's perspective, there are certainly pros and cons to subleasing commercial or office space. For example, subleases are often offered at rental rates below market because the current tenant is leasing to cover some of their cost and because there are inherent issues with subleasing that are not common in direct leases from a landlord to a tenant. Subleases are often rented without the CAM charges paid by a direct tenant. 
In addition to lower rates, a commercial sublease or sublet are generally finished spaces, so the sublessee will not have to build out the space for their use. The space may also include equipment such as a phone system or furniture. One of the risks of sublet space is that the lease is limited to an existing end date or term that's part of the original tenant's contract. This may obligate the sub lessee to relocate their business at the end of the term or to negotiate with the master landlord at the end of the term, which will certainly adversely impact the reduced rental rate. If the tenant or sub lessor is subletting the space because they don't need it presently, but want to maintain the location for future use, the sub lessee would have limitations on their ability to remodel the space. Additionally, the tenant or sub lessor could default on the lease. For example, the tenant could collect rent from the sub lessee and fail to pay the landlord, which would result in the sub lessor losing the space and being required to relocate their business on short notice. An assignment of lease is an alternative to a straight sublease. A tenant may have the right in their lease to have their lease assigned to a third party with the permission of the landlord. While this practice typically does not release the tenant from the liability under a lease, an assignment transfers the space to another business for the remaining term of the lease. Unlike a sublease where the sub lessee or subtenant pays the tenant who pays the landlord, in an assignment the assigned lessee pays the landlord directly effectively becoming a new tenant for that space. The original tenant, under the assignment of a lease, relinquishes all interest in that lease. If the new tenant fails to pay the landlord, however, the landlord still generally has recourse against the original tenant unless the landlord is willing to write a release of the original tenant. Analyzing leases for the best value. As rental payments and expenses vary dramatically and how they're calculated from lease to lease, Spaces under consideration by a tenant should be analyzed for the cost to the tenant. Earlier in this video, I talked about effective rent, which allows a quick apples-to-apples -apples comparison of overall cost per square foot, but doesn't compare the total cost of occupying one space versus another space. Another method of comparing leased space is to calculate the total occupancy cost of each space over the entire term of the lease. The total occupancy cost includes rent, any cam charges, estimated utility charges paid by the tenant, improvement costs, and other occupancy costs paid by the tenant, and any entry or exit expenses. Remember that some landlords will contribute towards tenant improvements, and some landlords will assist with moving or entry costs to the property. If the landlord is including a period of free rent or rent abatement, this should also be factored in. Let's do an example. Wayne Enterprises is considering two spaces for the new R&D lab in Gotham. The first space they're considering is 3,000 square feet and is being leased on a gross lease for $20 per square foot. The owner is willing to give three months free rent and cover the first year expenses, but is requiring a base stop where the tenant will pay the difference between the base year and the lease year. The current expenses are $4.25 per month, but expected to rise at 3% per year. Additionally, Wayne needs 10 parking spaces at $20 per parking space per month, and Wayne expects to have to pay for $20,000 in improvements to occupy the space. What's the total occupancy cost? To determine the total occupancy cost, we must add the base rent and all possible costs, including tenant improvements. Tenant paid expenses are calculated above the base year. The base year expense was $4.25 times 3,000 square feet or $12,750. If the expenses are growing at 3% each year, the tenant portion is that amount above $12,750 each year. If you follow the chart on the screen, the total cost of occupying the space over the five-year period is $320,941.49. That includes the $20,000 initial investment in tenant improvements and the cost of parking. If we divide by 3,000 square feet, it's a cost of about $107 per square foot over the term. But the important number is that nearly $321,000 figure. The second building Wayne is considering, the Harlequin, is larger than the first at 3,200 square feet and is being leased on a triple net lease where the base rent is $12 per square foot per year and the tenant is responsible for expenses of $4.75 per year which are also expected to rise at 3% per year.
The landlord of the second building is also offering a three month rent abatement and parking is also $20 per spot per year. In the second building, the cost of improvements is $20,000, but the landlord is giving a tenant allowance of $10,000, which will effectively bring the cost to Wayne down to $10,000. As we build a spreadsheet for this scenario, you'll find a lower base rent, much higher expenses, and a lower upfront improvement cost. The cost for the entire period adds up to $285,098.86, or about $89 per square foot. In comparing the two scenarios, Building A is more expensive in total cost than Building B. On a per square foot basis, Building B is an even better value because Building B is 3,200 square feet and leasing it just over $89 a square foot. A shortcoming of the total occupancy cost calculation is that it does not account for the time value of money. The cost of occupancy is spread out over the term of the lease and the when of payments can affect the overall cost to a tenant as much as the amount of the payments. For example, if the cost to occupy one space is lower overall, but the initial cost, such as tenant improvements, is very high, the tenant may ultimately benefit by selecting an alternative because cost today is worth more than cost in the future. A method of comparing two properties by their cost over time is to compute a net present value of the total occupancy cost of each property under consideration, selecting an appropriate discount rate. This process creates a net effective rate, which is the effective rate adjusted for the net present value of each payment. For example, if a full service lease calls for $20 per square foot for the first year, $22 per square foot for the second year, and $24 per square foot for the third year, with no other expenses, and the client's assumed cost of capital is 8%, we can discount the payments using the formula on the screen. The value in today's dollars, discounting the cost back by 8% per year, is the cost divided by 1 plus the discount rate to the power of the year. So in year 3, when the cost is $24 per year, we discount that by 1 plus 8% to the third power because we're in the third year. This is an advanced and complex concept, which you can learn more about in our investment videos. In addition to occupancy cost, there are other variables to consider when seeking the best property to lease. How a firm or individual compares a space depends on what's most important to them. For example, the most important consideration for a tenant may be location. A retail tenant targeting high income earners will certainly be more likely to lease in an upscale shopping complex rather than a neighborhood center in a depressed location, regardless of the rental rate differential. Similarly, an office tenant may want to be on an avenue location in New York City rather than a side street, and the firm may be willing to pay significantly more for that address. A leasing agent should assist their client in prioritizing their objectives because price may not be the single influencing factor. A real estate professional should assist the prospective tenant in both determining each space's total occupancy cost and in ranking the space under the most significant variables, including the location, the size of the space, the required lease term, and the positive and negatives about each space. Once you identify the perfect space, you'll likely assist your client in negotiating a letter of intent or an LOI. Generally, the first step in developing a lease for a commercial space is for the prospective tenant or tenant's representative to create a proposal for leasing that space. This proposal or letter of intent outlines the general terms of a lease. The letter of intent expedites the process of negotiation as formal leases take time to prepare and an LOI circumvents the expense of attorneys preparing full leases when general terms may not be agreed upon. Once the general terms are negotiated and the landlord and tenant reach a preliminary agreement, one of the party's attorneys can draft a formal lease which often requires additional negotiations of the specific terms and contingency clauses. A letter of intent should include or address each of the following points. Parties to the lease. Simply a statement of the landlord and tenants and under what name or LLC the tenants would like to take possession and sign a lease. Description of premises to be leased. A specific description of the unit or space being leased, which might include an attached highlighted diagram of the space. If the space being leased is an interior space, you might spell out details of the space in order to define it. For example, 
Unit 2A on the southwest corner of the second floor of 121 Broadway in the city of Burbank, California, containing approximately 1,250 square feet. The lease term. This section should include both the length of the term as well as the commencement date of the lease. If the lease is predicated on improvements or renovations to the space, then the letter of intent should spell out when the tenant expects the renovations to be completed, when they expect occupancy, and when the proposed rent shall begin. For example, the section may read, the lease shall commence when proposed improvements are substantially completed, but no later than December 1st of 2067, and shall continue for a period of 60 months. Proposed rent and escalations. The type of lease, such as gross, net, triple net, or percentage lease, the proposed rental payments on a gross or per square foot basis, and an outline of proposed escalations during the term of the lease. Other expenses and other financial obligations. What expenses the landlord and tenant are each responsible to pay? Intended use of the premises. The use of the premises may be very significant for several reasons. In retail, the property often has restrictions on the type of tenants or number of tenants in a particular category, such as food service. In industrial, property owners may want to consider the potential environmental issues with one prospective tenant over another. Signage, a section outlining the anticipated signage or signage required by the tenant should always be included in the letter of intent. Outline of tenant improvements and financial responsibility for improvements. What renovations, alterations, and repairs is the tenant requesting, and who shall be responsible for making the renovations? In retail, the tenant is often responsible for those renovations, while in office space, the landlord often does the renovations but amortizes the cost into the lease. A diagram of the renovations can be attached to the letter of intent, and even a renovation cost per square foot might be identified. Renewal or expansion options. If the tenant is planning on possible expansion, this should be discussed during the initial letter of intent rather than later when negotiating a final lease. Renewal options might also be included in the proposal. Binding or non-binding statement. There's an inherent risk of putting a proposal in writing in that one party or the other might argue in court that the written statement was binding upon the parties. Any letter of intent should include a statement as to whether or not the letter is binding. Although the majority of letters of intent are non-binding until a formal lease is drafted and negotiated, there are times when tenants request a letter of intent to be binding in order to secure or tie up the property in the event other parties are interested in leasing the premises. Signatures. Letters of intent should always be signed by the appropriate parties who are authorized to sign. An alternative is an RFP or request for proposal. A request for proposal is a request from a tenant for a proposal from landlords regarding their best offer to the tenants for the space the landlord has available. Although similar to a letter of intent, the RFP puts the onus on the landlord to make a proposal to the tenant. This technique is often employed by national tenants with strong credit. Landlords want strong tenants for the tenant's stability, and because strong tenants have a tendency to attract other strong tenants. Additionally, when the property is sold to an investor in the future, the investor is likely to buy at a lower cap rate, which leads to a higher sales price, if the tenants are very strong. The request for proposal is sent by the tenant or the tenant's representative to one or more property owners that are leasing space that's suitable for the tenant. The RFP contains a detailed description of the tenant's business and requirements for that space, as well as the tenant's financial capacity and possibly their business history. The tenant requests the property owner or management to provide a copy of their standard lease as well as the best terms that may be offered to a strong credit to client. The property owners or property managers are then encouraged to present a proposal back to the tenant, effectively bidding for the tenant's lease of the space. If the property owners choose to participate, they will respond with many of the same points found in the letter of intent, including the lease rate the owner will accept, the terms of the lease including any escalation clauses and any operating and maintenance fees, and the owner's offer of rent abatements, tenant allowances, or property improvements. Negotiation and final lease. While a letter of intent lays out the major points of a lease, it's only the first phase of negotiation. Each part of the process of leasing commercial space includes some form of negotiation. 
You'll also negotiate during the design and build out of the space, during a draft lease prepared by the landlord's attorney, and potentially even prior to signing a formal lease. Major points of negotiation include the rent, rent abatements, escalation of rent over the term of the lease, the term of the lease, tenant improvement costs, security deposits, and personal guarantees. Let's run through the major points. The term of the lease. Lease terms vary from one month to 99 years, depending on the needs of the landlord and tenants. Typically, commercial leases, however, range between one and five years. The length of the lease or the term of the lease is a critical factor in negotiation. Tenants who prefer short-term leases may be concerned about their changing need for space over time. However, short-term leases may hurt a tenant who may be replaced by a higher paying tenant next year. There is a cost for a tenant to move an office or retail business from one location to another, as well as include the cost of relocating a phone system, furniture, and simply the time involved in making a move. Retail businesses may suffer when customers can't find them. However, shorter term leases provide flexibility to the tenant if the tenant finds the need to expand, contract, or close in the future. Long-term leases may be beneficial to either the tenant or the landlord, depending on what the rate of increase for the rent payment might be. If a tenant locks into a specific rental rate for three to five years, the landlord may suffer a paper loss if rental rates in the same area rise significantly over the term of the lease. Similarly, if overbuilding in an area leads to a reduction or compression in rental rates, the tenant may be locked into paying higher than typical rent in the area by a longer term lease. As a rule, property owners typically desire long-term leases to strong tenants with built-in escalations in rent. The preferred lease for a tenant is to sign a shorter lease with a built-in renewal at a predetermined rate at the discretion of the tenant to exercise the renewal. The commencement date of the lease. While the commencement date appears straightforward, there are actually three possible dates that have to be described on the final lease. The start date of the lease may be at execution of the lease. At this point, the tenant may have access to the space to run wiring and begin construction, if the tenant is responsible for the construction. This should be carefully spelled out in the lease. Next is the date the tenant actually takes possession of the property. While this might be a specific date because the space is in move-in ready condition or requires only minor changes, the date might be fluid if the lease is predicated on a build-out or substantial improvements or renovations to the space. Landlords and tenants seldom have complete control over how long contractors take to complete the construction and how long a municipality takes to inspect the work and issue a certificate of occupancy. The final date is when rent begins. Although it is negotiable, rent should begin when the renovations are substantially complete. The lease will include the language substantially complete or similar language because a tenant cannot hold back rent based on minor finishes or a final punch list on the improvements. If the space can be occupied and business can be conducted, the lease should commence. If the tenant intentionally or unintentionally delays the improvements due to change orders or failure to submit municipal requirements in a timely fashion, the lease may give the landlord the right to begin collecting rent regardless of whether or not the renovations are actually complete. The ending date of the lease. The lease may have a specific commencement date and a specific termination date. If the lease is predicated on substantial improvements, the end date of the lease should be adjusted in the lease to avoid shortchanging the tenant or the landlord for the full value of that lease. For example, a tenant might sign a five-year lease beginning in January of the first year and ending at the end of the year in the fifth year. If construction is expected to be 30 days but is unexpectedly delayed for six months, the lease should not be shortened by this delay. A lease may be written for a period rather than a specific date in order to avoid this potential issue. A clause might be structured to include the language, the lease shall commence when proposed improvements are substantially complete, but not later than December 1st and shall continue for a period of 60 months. Rent and escalations. Rent is only one component of the overall cost of, for the tenant to occupy the property, and rent must be carefully negotiated. The second consideration in rent expense is the frequency of adjustments to the rental rate and the method of that adjustment. During the initial term of the lease, rent may be held stable or increased at scheduled intervals. Those increases may be based on a fixed rate of increase, based on a consumer price index or a CPI, 
or based on a scheduled renegotiation. A fixed increase, which is the most common form of an increase, may be a specific figure per square foot or may be a percentage increase. A CPI adjustment is based, as the name implies, on the consumer price index either locally or nationally. The argument for this form of escalation is that it keeps the rent in line with inflation. A CPI adjustment generally has a floor, so the rental rate can't go down below the base year or the prior year. Scheduled renegotiations typically do not happen during the primary lease period, but rather are utilized for renewals and lease extensions. Renegotiations that are built into a lease typically describe a process for arriving at a new rental rate based on the fair market rent at the time of the renewal. That fair market rent might be based on a specific industry survey or might be based on an appraiser's evaluation. The landlord and the tenant may both obtain appraisals of what the rental rate should be and negotiate the rent from the average of those appraisals. Rent abatements are periods of free or discounted rent. They're used to both attract tenants and to keep the base rents from declining in a slow market. A reduction in the base rent or advertised rent of a property can lead other tenants in the property to try to renegotiate their rent or create a problem for the landlord or property manager in leasing the next space. Landlords would rather negotiate some period of free rent to bring down or entice the tenant to lease the space rather than reduce the rent. Security deposits. Landlords of commercial property often require the last month's or second month's rent as a security deposit on the space. Some landlords request a security deposit even higher. Tenants try to minimize their upfront cash as they have significant costs when moving a business into a new space. Depending on the language of the security deposit clause, the deposit may be used for unpaid rent, for the repair of damage to the property, or even for altering the space once the tenant leaves. While a security deposit helps to ensure the landlord against sudden default of the tenant, the deposit effectively ties up tenants' funds for the term of the lease, which may be three years, five years, ten years, or even longer. This cost to the tenant is greater than the funds themselves because the tenant loses the opportunity cost of investing those funds into another vehicle, whether it's their own business or another investment. National companies use their size to argue that there is less risk of a default and often avoid security deposits. While reviewing a security deposit clause, the tenant and landlord must spell out what constitutes a default of the lease, what cures are possible prior to the release of the security deposit to the landlord, and at what point the security deposit might be released back to the tenant. Alternatives to a security deposit include a letter of credit or a personal guarantee. In effect, a letter of credit is an open line of credit from a lender that secures a landlord against a tenant default. While the instrument frees up cash tenant would have to use for a security deposit, lenders often require additional collateral such as negotiable securities or a lien against some defined collateral which cannot be sold or liquidated while the credit is open. Unfortunately, not all businesses can obtain a letter of credit. A personal guarantee is a legal guarantee that the tenant or partners of the business guarantee the amount of the security deposit personally. If the business fails or fails to fulfill the terms of the lease, the landlord can attach the assets of the business or the owners personally. Tenants may be able to negotiate a clause in the lease that reduces the security deposit or reduces the liability under a letter of credit or a personal guarantee over time. If the lease is five years, the tenant may negotiate to have 20% of the deposit returned each year or a 20% reduction in the guarantee. This process is called a burn down of the deposit. Leases also have use clauses. Landlords want to know how their space is going to be used by the tenant, and the landlords of shopping centers try and shape the center to attract the maximum visitors and often make promises to tenants about what percentage of the center will be dedicated to one type of business versus another type. Industrial landlords want to ensure that their property isn't used for a purpose that may contaminate the property and require significant cleanup expense. Office landlords may have a tenant that has an exclusivity clause that forbids any other dentists or any other title companies in that building. Tenants must be careful that the restrictions listed in the use clause are broad enough to allow for any business they may conduct. Some clauses are intentionally structured to be very restrictive. A variation of the use clause is a restrictive clause 
which outlines what business activities the tenant is restricted from doing in their space. A tenant may be prohibited from selling vacuum cleaners, for example, if another tenant has the exclusive rights in the building to sell vacuum cleaners. Alternately, a tenant may request their own exclusive clause be included in the lease in order to avoid having a direct competitor in the same commercial property. Option to renew and subletting clauses. Tenants must prepare for the possibility of the business being better or worse than expected. At some point, the tenant may want to expand their space or at least renew their space. If a renewal clause is not part of the initial lease, the landlord does not have to honor it if they believe they can find a replacement tenant at a higher rate that provides more value to the property. In the event a tenant doesn't need as much space or no longer needs the space, a tenant may need to sublet their space to cover that rent or even assign the lease to a third party. The parties must negotiate through their representatives to determine these clauses. Property improvement clauses. Is the tenant paying for improvements? Is the landlord agreeing to pay for improvements? Will the landlord pay for improvements up front and charge back the tenants over time in the rent payment? Is the tenant permitted to do renovations after they occupy the space? Must the tenant receive written permission from the landlord for any renovations or improvements? Maintenance clauses. A maintenance clause spells out which party, landlord or tenant, will be responsible for care, maintenance, and repair of the property. The clause may separate duties based on the interior of the space, the exterior of the space, and common areas, or they may be delineated by what is considered a major repair or a minor repair. A maintenance clause may also determine which party is responsible if the municipality requires updates or upgrades, or that might be included in a compliance clause. Insurance clauses. Tenants are responsible for maintaining insurance on their own contents within their space that they are leasing. They are also generally required to purchase liability insurance, which lists the landlord as an additional insured party. Other insurances are often negotiated between the landlord and tenant in order to protect both parties. A lease should spell out who is responsible for any insurance and what each will cover. Tenant relocation clauses. Leases for shopping centers and office buildings may contain the language that a landlord may require a tenant to move to another location in the building. This clause is most commonly used to protect the landlord's ability to provide expansion to a major tenant. For example, if a large grocery store wants to expand and is at the center of a shop surrounded by smaller retailers, the landlord may be forced to satisfy the grocery store rather than lose their major tenant by shifting the adjoining tenants to other spaces. If this clause is a requirement of the landlord, a tenant may protect themselves somewhat by negotiating that the landlord will pay moving expenses and an additional monetary figure for the possible temporary loss of income and inconvenience for the tenant. Subordination clause and non-disturbance clause. The lender for a commercial property may require any lease to include language to subordinate the lease to the lender's mortgage. If the property owner, the landlord, defaults in their mortgage and the lender forecloses, the lender then has the right to terminate the lease. Obviously, tenants do not want to be evicted by the lender when they have no control over whether or not their landlord pays the mortgage. Tenants have a strong stake in remaining in their space. They make significant investments in the space in terms of tenant improvements, and tenants also have established a business at a particular location, and a simple move might create a loss of business. The negotiation of this removal of a subordination clause, however, might be beyond the control of the landlord if the clause is a requirement of the lender. Even without a subordination clause, a lease that's signed after a mortgage is placed on the property is automatically subordinated to that mortgage. A method of mitigating the risk for a tenant is to include a non-disturbance agreement with the lender. A non-disturbance agreement is a clause or document that requires the lender to leave the tenant in place after foreclosure as long as the tenant continues to abide by the original lease and continue making the rent payments and any other expense charges. Both the subordination and non-disturbance clauses may be included in the lease or may be written into a separate agreement signed by the lender. Other common clauses include parking, signs, and landlord entry. Leases need to itemize and explain all tenant and landlord rights and responsibilities. Will any parking be designated to a particular tenant? Is there a fee for that parking? How will it be segregated from other tenant spaces? What kind of business signs are allowed on the property and how may they be positioned? 
Does the landlord have the right to enter the tenant's space at will? Must the landlord provide notice or may the landlord only enter in the event of an emergency? Attorneys who regularly write commercial leases will develop a library of lease clauses, including standard common clauses they can plug into a lease, as well as alternate versions that might be more appropriate for some situations or might be more acceptable to some landlords and tenants who might have an issue with the common versions. An experienced attorney who can provide this service will often shorten the time frame of drafting a lease. Another type of lease clause is a trigger event clause or a just-in-case clause. Attorneys can add a myriad of different clauses to leases to cover every possible issue that might arise, and I'm fairly certain some of these attorneys are paid by the word. These clauses can range from the tenant or landlord violating any portion of the lease to what happens in the event of a fire, flood, hurricane, landslide, nuclear war, flying pigs, or an alien attack. These clauses are written to outline the rights of the landlord and tenant and what remedies are available to the injured party. Common ones include a default clause, breach clause, and damage or destruction clause. A default clause is triggered if the tenant fails to pay the rent by the due date. How long does the tenant have before the landlord might seize possession of the lease space? What remedies are available to the tenant to rectify the situation? A default may be an abandonment of the space, a failure to pay rent, or a bankruptcy of the tenant. A default clause spells out what the landlord or tenant's rights are in a default. Typically, leases outline how quickly a landlord may terminate the lease and recapture the space under a default, what the landlord may do with any assets, furniture, or equipment in the space after abandonment, and how the security deposit may be used to correct damages or pay for unpaid rent. A breach clause may be a default by the tenant but the clause is generally a broader definition. What if either party breaches the lease? Is there a remedy or does the landlord have the right to evict the tenant or does the tenant have the right to damages if the landlord breaches? For example, if the tenant has an exclusive use clause for the right to sell ice cream and the landlord leases an end cap to a coffee shop that also sells ice cream, what are the tenant's rights? What if the tenant pays the rent but is chronically late? Any failure of the tenant or landlord to perform any part of the lease may be considered a breach. A damage and destruction clause is not a maintenance clause. If a property is substantially damaged, a tenant may be unable to conduct their business. A damage or destruction clause outlines the level or extent of destruction and the remedies to the parties. For example, if one side of the building is damaged by fire, while the tenant side only receives minor smoke damage, the landlord may have a certain period of time to correct any damage that may affect the tenant's ability to use the space for their business, or the lease may be terminated. Rent may be abated during the period of cleaning or reconstruction. If the building is substantially destroyed, the lease is typically terminated with no further obligation of the tenant to the landlord. If the tenant's space is damaged, the tenant must immediately notify the landlord. If the damage was done as a result of the actions of the tenants, then the tenants will have no right to cancel the lease. If the damage was a result of vandalism or an act of God, then the landlord will have a reasonable period of time to make repairs or rebuild that space before the tenant has any right to terminate the lease. Landlord and tenant improvements. While most spaces need to be redefined, updated, or built out when a commercial or office tenant moves into the space, the burden of the improvement depends partly on what type of space is being leased and partly on negotiation between the landlord and the tenant through the representatives. Retail space, for example, is generally delivered as a blank slate, with the tenant left to manage and finance their improvements. While some retail property owners will finish the space and amortize the cost into the lease, tenants such as restaurants and franchise services require equipment to be incorporated into the space and are more likely to finance their own improvements. Alternately, a common element in office space leases is the negotiation of and the financial responsibility for improvements to the property being leased. Tenants will often want to reconfigure or improve the property to meet their business needs. Landlords may be willing to make capital improvements that will increase the overall value of the property, but will be unlikely to want to make specific improvements that would really only benefit a specific tenant unless those improvements are included in the rental payment by amortizing that cost into the rental rate. For this reason, Properties leased with improvements specific to the tenant are often leased for longer periods of time, such as five to ten years, 
in order to incorporate the cost of the improvements. Leases should also spell out whether or not the tenant is permitted to make improvements or renovations to the space without the landlord's written permission. Although tenant improvements will often improve the value of the property, there are renovations that are so specific to a particular tenant that it may devalue the space when the tenant moves. In addition to the capital to build out the renovate space, improvements require space planning and management. An initial design is done by an architect at the bequest of the tenant. Although this plan becomes the basis for the working drawings for building out the space, there are several parties who have to agree to the plan. Property owners or landlords want to approve any changes to the space and may require in the lease that the space be put back in its original condition when the tenant vacates the property. Municipal governments often have requirements for review of plans and oversight of projects by way of approvals during each phase of the construction. The contractor for the space may also have suggestions or changes during the construction phase. Finally, key employees in the tenant's firm are likely to have input into designs, including their offices within the space. Often these plans go through several iterations before a final design is completed and signed off by all parties involved. The plan must be detailed enough that the tenant or landlord can obtain bids from contractors on the construction of the improvements. Tenant allowances. As with every part of commercial leases, tenant allowances are negotiated in many different ways. The two most common methods landlords offer are a turnkey build-out or a stated improvement contribution. Under a turnkey build-out, the landlord pays all or most of the cost to build out the space. While this may be preferable to many tenants, consider that the landlord is likely to factor in an additional contingency cost in case the project runs over and to include project management cost into that construction, driving up the cost to be amortized into the tenant's lease. Additionally, the landlord may be in charge of the quality of materials being installed and control of the construction process. If the landlord instead provides a specific amount towards the tenant build-out, the tenant has control over the costs. The risk with the cash contribution, however, is of the potential cost overruns because the tenant is inexperienced in construction. The tenant is rarely a construction expert and is unlikely to be capable of managing the entire construction project themselves, including permits and inspections. So they'll have to rely on a con contractor or construction management team. In either a turnkey build-out or a stated improvement contribution, the tenant allowance has to be carefully calculated to ensure it covers the cost of the improvements. Some landlords and management companies use standardized figures to offer toward tenant allowances. For example, their calculation may include 200 feet of interior walls, 8 lights, and 32 outlets per every 1,000 square feet of office space. This also may be based on using average or lower grade materials. A tenant must consider, based on the architectural drawing, what improvements they need, and what quality materials, and be certain the allowance covers the build-out. Finally, let's talk about other types of leases. In addition to traditional leases, where a tenant or user leases a building or portion of a building for a period of time, there are alternate types of leases to suit almost any situation. A ground lease, also known as a land lease, a ground lease is simply the lease of the land only. In a ground lease, a tenant or user will build their own structures on the property for their own business. Because of the nature of the cost involved to a tenant or user, these leases tend to be for very, very long periods of time generally more than 10 years. Ownership of any building placed on the property reverts to the property owner at the end of the lease term. Users may be willing to lease the ground and build their own buildings or structures in high traffic location because the user will generate a good return from their business investment into the property. A build-out lease, also known as a build-a-suit lease. In a situation where the owner is willing to build out a property to specifically suit the tenant, the cost of construction is generally amortized into the lease of the space. For example, if the owner of a vacant lot is willing to build a freestanding building to suit the tenant's needs, the owner will want to increase the rent to compensate for the owner's additional construction cost. The same situation applies if a tenant is leasing a clear span space in a warehouse or office building and wants that space finished into private offices. And sale and lease back. This is a situation where the owner will sell the building to a buyer or an investor and lease back part or all of the building for their use. This happens in cases where the original owner still wants or needs use of the space, 
but maybe in a property where he's property rich and cash poor. The owner wants or needs immediate capital while retaining use of the property. This can also occur when an owner no longer needs the entire space or builds a building to suit the company needs and would rather operate the business than be a landlord to other tenants in the building. Leasebacks are often long-term net leases. I hope you've learned something from today's program. Whether it's a better understanding of gross or full service leases versus triple net leases, or what CAM fees or an expense stop is, or some clauses that leases require that you might not have considered. Let me leave you today with a few quick assignments so you can improve your knowledge and understanding of leases and lease terms. First, I want you to search your local MLS system or whatever system you use to find local commercial properties for lease. Select a few properties that are listed as net lease properties. Call the listing agent and find out what expenses are required for the tenant to pay as part of the lease. This is going to help you to understand how the terms are expressed locally. Second, I want you to take the time to visit several properties for lease in your area so you can get a feel for how much space actually cost. Then I'd like you to sit down and compare those costs of those spaces, including any CAM charges or net charges the tenant might pay. And finally, I want you to review any recent commercial leases in your office. Look at both office and retail leases if they're available. Read through the clauses so you get a basic understanding of what terms are common in your area. As always, I'm going to leave you with a few quotes to think about. First, I believe that every lease can be a win-win for both the landlord and the tenant. Bernard Baruch once said, you don't have to blow out the other person's light to let your own shine. Some aspects of leasing and rent negotiations can be brutal, and I'm certain you'll run across realtors and attorneys who want nothing but the perfect deal for their clients at the expense of all others. But in the end, what we really want is a win-win for our clients. Carl Albrock said, start out with an ideal and end up with a deal. Negotiation is an art form, and while we certainly want the best possible scenario for our clients, we also have to realize that we want both parties to win. The landlord wants a successful tenant who will remain for a long period of time and provide the landlord with a solid return on their investment. The tenant wants a strong landlord who will maintain the building, upgrade the property, and not be subject to a foreclosure which would force the tenant to vacate the space. One of the greatest challenges of negotiating a lease is that emotion clouds our judgment and leads us to make poor decisions. A property owner might take offense to a comment by a tenant, or a tenant might believe that the landlord is holding out on some point out of greed. Howard Baker wrote, the most difficult thing in any negotiation, almost, is making sure that you strip it of the emotion and deal with the facts. The greatest value of a real estate professional in leasing is not marketing the property or securing appointments with a client but rather is acting as a third party between the tenant and the landlord to help facilitate the transaction that will benefit both of them. Until next time, I'm Lauren Keim with Real Estate's Next Level Education, and you've been watching the introduction to commercial real estate leases, the fourth session in our commercial training system. I hope to see you in the next program.